if I look back at that first section, I sort of sense with great respect that we tell the story from where we are standing, from people who deliver, and some people who own, and one or two people who operate, but not many. This next section is seeing the same equation from outside of our sector. Um, and it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker, Michael, um, from the um, head of Strategic Research Centre at Rolls-Royce, who hopefully is going to stick a stick in the great hornet's nest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I feel I've been nicely teed up before uh, the break and uh, some of the discussions earlier, and hopefully this will kind of resonate with some of the things that you're doing in your industry, but actually looking from a very different industry and how we've taken digital and really evolved the services that we developed perhaps even 20 years ago now, how we completely changed the shape of the aerospace industry and how we're now continuing to go on that journey. Um, I guess I should give a bit of context about Rolls-Royce. Uh, hopefully nobody in this room will ask me what car I drive because that's the standard question we get. Um, I don't drive a Rolls-Royce. Uh, but um, basically we have five businesses. Uh, we're an, uh, very much a global company, but if I just canter through to give you a feel, biggest part of the company is civil aerospace where we're the, now the global leader in the wide body, so the, the big long haul aircraft. Um, and also the very sort of top end uh, business jet <coughs> market. And that's based in Derby primarily, but um, very much a global business. And that's really the part of the business I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. In terms of defence, we lead particularly in transport. Um, so aircraft like the Hercules, where we provide the engines for, dominated out of Indianapolis in the States. Uh, but we also have a base in the UK um, and uh, some of our technology pedigree through things like the Pegasus have enabled us to provide power for the Joint Strike Fighter, the vertical takeoff and lift version of that. Power systems, formerly MTU diesels, so big reciprocating engine uh, business. Um, probably with, given we talk about digital and data, well actually the engines we produce in our reset business are so reliable they're used as backup power for a lot of the data centres around the world, um, but also used in the marine industry. <coughs> Uh, our marine sector particularly focused on offshore oil and gas, uh, as you can imagine quite challenging times at the moment in that sector, but very much a high tech part of the marine industry and actually ship intelligence is a massive theme for us in that sector and fusing of data and how we offer more sophisticated services, so one for another day in terms of what we're doing on marine. And then nuclear, I think we're the only company in the world that uh, has full design authority, manufacturing authority and operates uh, nuclear stations, so uh, primarily in the nuclear fleet. Um, but we also have a civil nuclear business dealing with services and hopefully expanding that as we go forwards. Um, as you can see, uh, I guess we're quite unusual in having a huge order book relative to our revenues. So we have the luxury of really long-term visibility in terms of revenue stream. And some of that comes out through I guess mega trends in terms of growth in the aerospace industry, but also what we've done to revolutionise the kind of services we offer. Um, and you'll notice that about 50% of our revenue now is service revenue. So we've really transformed from a business that was delivering parts, you know, original equipment to suppliers, to now actually we offer that complete service package. And that's completely changed the dynamic of the business. Just in terms of, so I'm not going to get too technical, but, but a bit of context for how difficult what we do is. And, and really in terms of wide body engines, there's only two companies in the world today, Rolls-Royce and General Electric, that can do this kind of stuff. Um, so a typical gas turbine aero engine is about the same value per weight as silver. Um, apologies to my automotive colleagues, but a car is about the same as a hamburger, so that perhaps gives you some, <laughs> some context. Um, in, in terms of some of the technical challenges, uh, so this component in the middle is a HP turbine blade sits in the heart of the engine. On our big civil engines, we have somewhere between 70 and 90 of those in an engine. Each one of those, you can see it's about the size of a credit card, produces the same horsepower as a <coughs> Formula One racing car, and when it's spinning at speed, it operates in a gas temperature that is several hundred degrees beyond its melting point. 
and you have the equivalent of the weight of a London bus hanging off the end of it in terms of CF load. So my challenge to you is to go home, put a piece of ice in the oven, make it last uh, several years, uh, and put a big load on it. And that's some of the engineering challenges that we have. Um, and we've got to hit that kind of amazing levels of dispatch reliability. And I'll talk about some of the customer expectations that go behind this technology. We're quite an interesting industry in terms of the, the economic dynamics. So you can see there, um, from a revenue point of view, services actually dominate. So once we get one of these big engines on wing, over its lifespan, it'll generate typically four times the original equipment cost in service revenue through its life. So in a way, we're a bit like sophisticated razor blades. You get it on, and actually, we make money from the aftermarket. But you can see fuel actually is the dominant factor. And that's just in terms of the aero engine cost to give you a flavour. If you actually look at a typical operator, about 50% of a civil airline operating cost is fuel. So we spend about £1.2 billion a year on R&D, of which about £800 million is principally looking at how do we improve the fuel consumption of the engine. And, and we'll come on to some of the additional services we're starting to offer around fuel in a minute. Um, just in terms of context, I compared a, a gas turbine to a Ferrari. Um, so our gas turbine engines, aero engines, they have to last about 25 years on wing, um, up to 14 hours a day of operation. Over that period, we'll typically do six planned overhauls. Parts of the engine actually designed for life, so some of the major structures of the engine. And then we modularize the engine, so different parts of the engine will come in at different intervals. So some of the really central hot parts of the engine will overhaul every shop visit, other parts maybe every other or maybe even every third shot visit. Um, and you can kind of see the stats, you know, 40 million miles from one engine. Uh, if it was a Ferrari, you'd certainly be doing a lot of tyre changes, a lot of engine changes, and probably buying several new cars in that time frame. Um, one of the things that's driven our industry is the kind of evolution of expectations. So um, when I joined the company about, uh, I guess, middle of this chart, Integrity and safety were very much a given, and that runs right the way through the culture of the company. Uh, fundamentally, if we get something wrong, we could do significant harm. Um, but back in the sort of late 90s, uh, the industry, one of the revolutions in the industry was these big wide-body twin-engined aircraft. So ETOP stands for Extended Twin Operations Over Sea, and you imagine now you're flying potentially four hours on our latest aircraft from the nearest airport. If you have one engine that fails, you need to be damn sure the other one's going to keep operating reliably, reliably to get you home. So actually that drove a significant expectation from a regulatory point of view, from a design standard point of view, and a, you know, getting into service to enable airlines from the get-go to fly on these long-range missions. So reliability, absolutely critical. The A380, deliberately up at the top of that chart, really also set a benchmark. So the A380 is still, even though it's not the latest air airline aircraft that uh, an airline can buy, it's very much the flagship of the fleet. And it sets an expectation above all air other aircraft in terms of reliability. So if you imagine, if you have a, a problem with an engine on an A380 <coughs> that grounds it, let's say you ground it somewhere remote, you've got the best part of 500 people that potentially you have to put in a hotel. And if you operate an A380, you don't have another aircraft that's bigger than that. So if you've got a smaller aircraft, potentially you can fly another aircraft in, you can move people around. An A380, they might have one hot spare, but it might be halfway around the world. And for a big airline, if you cause a cancellation, it can cost the airline the best part of half a million pounds for a single cancellation. So really high expectations of reliability. And obviously everyone these days has got Twitter, YouTube, <coughs> mobile phones that can stream video. So we've got a massive increase in avoiding those kind of disruptions for the airlines and for the customers, so avoiding remote site issues and any unscheduled events. How has, um, I guess, Rolls-Royce responded to that? Well, interestingly, we've got to respond in terms of supporting a very global fleet. Um, and another stat that's not on that chart, um, to give you a feel, I think Rolls-Royce products tr um, effectively transport about the population of India every year. So close to a billion people every year will fly on a Rolls-Royce um, powered aircraft. Uh, every two and a half seconds an aircraft takes off or lands, and this is very global. So our, our ability to understand how the engines are operated in that global environment to 
control it, service it, and so on, you can see the complexities in there. Um, to support those kind of growing expectations, we've gone on really a journey in terms of services. So uh, perhaps in the sort of 80s and 90s, we offered really quite basic OEM services. So we'd sell an engine and we wouldn't do a lot more than that. We might give them a manual in terms of overhaul, but that was kind of the limit of the services we did. Um, as the, I guess, our market share grew, so at the time we had less than 10% of the wide body market share, we now have 45% and we'll go to over 50% in the next five years. We started to build an infrastructure of overhaul bases, um, working with joint ventures, setting up partnerships. Um, and started to offer some basic services. So that could be advice on when you bring an engine in, what kind of maintenance might you do, even to offering services to ship engines to particular overhaul bases, but still quite kind of generic basic level services. And really the big change for us was going to this what we call dollar per engine flyer, flying hour, or ultimately Total Care, which is a Rolls-Royce uh, trademark kind of service deal. Um, and I suppose part of this was how do we get an alignment between what matters to the airline and the customer uh, compared to what matters to Rolls-Royce as a supplier. So in an OEM world and an overhaul services world, back to we generate and we make the money from the aftermarket, in that world actually it's really beneficial for Rolls-Royce as a company to have quite an unreliable engine that comes in for lots of maintenance because that's how we make money but ultimately that's not in the interest of the industry or our customers and certainly isn't great for kind of <coughs> encouraging repeat business. So going to this dollar per flying hour basis, the airline effectively pays us a revenue based on how they operate the aircraft. It's not quite a fixed rate, so some of the digital infrastructure is important. So if you're operating you know, with a very heavy aircraft, very hot environment, so very high levels of thrust on a long flight, the dollar per flying hour will be different compared to if you're operating on a short flight or if you're operating in a cold environment. Um, but essentially that gives a kind of guaranteed revenue stream for us and then it's absolutely in our incentive to make the engine as reliable as possible, to last as long as possible and to cause the minimum disruption. So in one fell swoop we've aligned the industry requirements <coughs> from the manufacturer's point of view and the customer's point of view. Um, and it's been tremendously successful, so actually by getting that alignment, using some of the digital capabilities and the broader service understanding that we built up I'm, that I'm going to talk about, you can see some of the stats in terms of the improved availability, reliability of the engines, um, better sort of awareness and, and guarantees uh, for the airlines in terms of their costs, um, and uh, really massive success in terms of uh, operators. So. To give you a feel, um, about 90% of our fleet now goes on Total Care in terms of new orders. And of all the customers we have on Total Care, 100% of those, when they come to order a new engine, will choose Total Care. So it's, it's really flipped the industry on, on its head and it's forced our competitors to go down a similar kind of operating model. Uh, to make it work, I'm just, uh, this will actually kind of ring um, bells with the presentation that you saw just before the break. Um, this is how we describe how we do engine health monitoring. So this is one of the key cornerstones to being able to offer that kind of through life service contract because ultimately for us to do that we have to know how the operators are operating the engine. And we describe it in these five steps. Uh, so sense, acquire, transfer, analyse and act. Um, and it might sound complex but I'm actually just going to try and walk you through some of the evolutions on that. So yes we're getting more and more sophisticated at this but some of the basics of it were quite straightforward. So sense actually for us, the kind of things that we measure on an engine are pressures, temperatures, shaft speeds, vibration, <coughs> aircraft environment, so what the flight condition is, fuel flow, um, oil pressures, those kind of things. So actually quite kind of rudimentary standard parameters. And when we first introduced engine health monitoring on the very, very early trends, we basically would take snapshots of that data at critical flight conditions like takeoff, climb, cruise, descent, engine start. And we only collected about 25 kilobytes of data per flight. So peanuts in the context of what we can do now. But even with that data, we could do trending so we could understand how the engine was deteriorating. We knew how the engine was being operated so we could affect the total care rates depending on the missions that airlines were flying. 
um, and we could start to do some sort of failure detection, if you like. So if we had particular issues in service, we could go back, look at the EHM data and spot signatures, build that into the system, so then automatically we could use that to detect potential um, arisings in advance in future. Nowadays, the latest systems, so uh, gigabytes per hour of data, um, we in some cases will take data every second or even less than that. Um, we do quite a lot of on-engine processing of that data, so if you imagine vibration data, broadband data, massive amounts of data, so a lot of the signal conditioning and processing and, um, and analytics are done on-engine. Um, what you can see in that acquire box is an engine health monitoring box. So we also split control from health monitoring and that's quite important. So control is really the, uh, I think as, as Mark was describing, the, the immediate safety aspect of the engine requires very high levels of safety software. Uh, tremendous regulation around that. Um, but some of the health monitoring data actually want to be a bit more flexible. So you know, how we transmit that data, whether it's through satellite or Wi-Fi, will depend on what the infrastructure is and what the cost is. So today we don't transmit much through satellite because it's expensive, but we might want to upgrade those systems in the future to use more satellite, less perhaps the, the Wi-Fi systems, the gate link as the aircraft comes up to the gate. So having those separate boxes gives us the, the safety and the firewalls and the integrity in the flight control systems um, while being able to then plumb out some of the health monitoring data in a more flexible manner. Uh, transfer, so I've talked about most of that, so, so typically when an aircraft comes up to a gate actually there's a wireless link so we can take a lot of the data through that. Some of the snapshot data that we still look at in flight will go through satellites and if there's any particular uh, thresholds that are exceeded again we can use satellite data. So we have op centres that literally can understand what's happening to the aircraft while it's still in flight and start the process of how do we get maintenance capability on the ground for when it lands so that we've and proactively taking that capability. The analysis of that data, so initially we just built up some feature detectors, if you like, from signatures that we'd seen from previous events. Um, and over time we've got gradually more sophisticated on that. Um, and now we also back that up with neural networks, so the learning systems that understand what normal looks like for the engine. So we're not reliant on having seen a particular event before. It can actually say, yeah, this is something that isn't normal, uh, flag it, and then we can get our engineers to look at that. And the ACT part, so for me, the engineer and the, the sort of original equipment manufacturing experience in the loop is absolutely critical to the services we offer. So all that data analytics then is, is backed up by our engineering knowledge, our understanding of the failure modes of the engine, the reliability drivers of the engine. And fundamentally, from an operational point of view, the kind of actions we'll give are um, maybe operational ones in terms of changing the flight profile, changing the route structure, um, maintenance, which could be go and do an inspection or a repeat inspection, or ultimately, just uh, as a precaution, take an engine off wing and swap it out. So there's a range of different kind of uh, act um, uh, results that you can get from it. Um, to underpin that, actually, we built up quite a significant capability. So I guess without walking through all the details on here, the kind of key things for me are building up some of the overhaul bases, so aero repair and overhaul, hazel, sazel, etc. So joint, shop, uh, joint ventures with other companies that give us the capability to actually maintain the engines when they come in the shop. Um, data systems and services on the bottom there was critical in terms of some of our data analytics capability and our understanding to take all that data and make useful insights and decisions from it. Uh, and then an operation centre, so the first one of those opened in Derby in 2006 and that provides a 24-7, 365-day a year expert sort of line of sight capability where all the data gets streamed in. We have service reps there and any airline with any issues can ring up and we're also actively monitoring the data and we can issue um, advice based on that. Um, so some of the networks in terms of the overhaul base is now very much global um, and some of the changes we've made this year is historically we've had territorial rights on some of those overhaul bases. Now as we have a massively growing fleet actually we need to reintroduce competition into that um, capability. So the territorial rights have gone and Delta Tech Ops we've just opened beginning of this year is actually not a, not a Rolls-Royce owned facility at all so they're effectively 
all the capital, all the investments come from Delta and we just uh, award them an approved maintenance centre basis and they can compete commercially with the other facilities. So in that service model, I think understanding the commercials on how you do the maintenance, how you make sure it's competitive is actually quite important, what contracts you put in place, how you set that up. Um, one, so, so I guess really interesting, we've, we've kind of changed the industry, we've turned it on its head, um, but actually we're going through another revolution <coughs> at the moment. Uh, I haven't got time to talk in detail, but just to kind of tee up the concept. So historically we've had a, a straight time and materials offering and a total care offering, and they're quite sort of extreme ends of the spectrum. Uh, and now we have really a range of engines across a wide range of maturities and positions in their life. Uh, and when you come to some of our older engines, which have been on total care, those engines are now starting to come towards the end of the life. And some of the sort of benefits from the full-scale total care are perhaps of less relevance. So an operator who knows his engine he's only going to use for another three years and then he's going to park it in a desert is actually less interested in what the asset value of that engine is at the end of the time <coughs> he's used it for. Uh, lessers, increasingly, uh, airlines are actually buying engines through lessers, not direct. So the kind of services in terms of risk and what the, the lesser is willing to pay for, what they want us to guarantee, how we transfer that risk might be different compared to an airline. And also we've got different types of operators. So quite often in an aerospace cycle we'll sell initially to the, you know, the flag carriers, the Emirates, the British Airways, etc. And then gradually those engines will get passed on to maybe second, third, third tier operators. And so again, the kind of services that they want, the business models, the level of risk they're willing to take, what they're willing to pay for may be different. So increasingly, actually, rather than just having a one-size-fits-all total care solution, we're starting to offer a range of different mixes, some of which will guarantee, for example, a shop visit cost, but not the time on wing, or guarantee some other services uh, and other things might be optional. So this kind of tailor-made packaging is something we're now starting to offer. Um, everything we've talked about so far really has been around maintenance, um, so how we optimise the use of the engine from a maintenance perspective, what the optimum time is to bring it off wing and what the optimum uh, work scope is when we bring it into a shop. If you look at an airline's operation, the engine maintenance is actually only worth about 4% of operational cost, and yet we collect a whole amount of data about the operation of the aircraft that we're now starting to use to increase the kind of services that we offer. So principally those are around availability of the aircraft, efficiency of the aircraft and asset value. Uh, some of those things are built in, um, so efficiency clearly quite a bit of that is how efficient is the engine, how efficient is the aircraft design, but rather like some of the smart discussions earlier, how you operate it can still affect the efficiency of that asset. So we're now starting to be able to offer services that can cover a much broader spectrum of the total operating cost of that aircraft. Um, some of the digital capabilities, so this is deliberately quite a busy chart because actually it shows the kind of <coughs> breadth of capabilities that we've built up over time. So in terms of data, we've got the engine health monitoring data that I've talked about. We also have aircraft health monitoring data, some of the maintenance data, um, the aircraft itself also has something called quick access recorder data that records vast amounts of data every second. So all of that data is potentially available to really understand not just how the engine's operating, but how the whole platform is being operated. There's some environmental data, so obvious things like weather, air traffic control data, if there's any route restrictions and so on. And then context data, so increasingly now we're looking at how can we fuse some of this data with our customers' data. So how do we bring in some of their operational data? So, um, you know, they might have specific maintenance requirements based on their own resource loads, what their flight capacities are, and so on. Um, and how do we help them in terms of their fleet planning? So all of that information can come in. We're starting to develop more cloud-based ecosystem architectures to take all of that data, so data lakes, that kind of concept. Um, and the analytics that can go behind that, so I've touched on a couple already, so things like detecting specific features. So this is where we've historically seen a certain type of issue and we can see the signature for that. But also things like prognostics. So this is where we can understand the reliability of a system and we can forward predict when it might be a sensible risk point to make 
uh, some decisions about it. Uh, optimization, so things like flight profiling and so on. Um, and the kind of things that we can get out of that, there's obviously insights and reports, so um, some of the details in here, minimum equipment list, so when an aircraft takes off it must have certain key um, capabilities on the engine functioning. There's a level of redundancy, but what level of risk do you take? So if something's gone down and you're flying to a remote base, do you actually need to take some maintenance now or do you, do you wait? Um, and then ultimately in some of the decision port support, so for optimizing the overall um, fleet, uh, which aircraft do you use on which flight? So if you know one particular aircraft is more efficient, you might use it on a, a particular mission that needs more fuel. And how do you really optimize that around their total ecosystem? Uh, and that's backed up by the sort of 24-7 infrastructure that we have behind it. So ultimately, that's enabling us to offer services that cut across all of those different value streams. So rather than just the engine maintenance, we're now looking at being able to help in terms of aircraft availability, efficient sectors, how you op optimize the, um, the routing and so on, uh, and asset value. Um, I'm going to wick through this really, really quickly, but just some examples. So flight profiling, some of the aircraft data, we can now give advice on you know, specific missions, what the optimum levels of flight profiling, takeoff, D-rate type of missions that we can do. Pilot advice, so single engine taxi, reverse thrust, um, maintenance advice. So we've been doing quite a lot of this on our own engines, but we now start to be able to do this on a platform level. So um, inherently when we design engines, we'll design it for the worst mission, but a typical mission is much less severe. So how can we use some of this data to improve um, that optimization and reduce some of the conservatism um, and availability. So clearly we've done a big shift in terms of engine availability. Now actually we're starting to look at some of the aircraft systems and using some of our capabilities to improve uh, the aircraft availability. So overall, just to sum up, I guess some of those services are, are the next revolution in what we're offering in the aerospace field. Uh, and we're already actually starting to get some key customers on board that are now and buying some of those services. So here are examples of those. So hopefully that gives you an insight into how we're kind of evolving the services that we offer, some of the digital underpinning. Um, thank you very much. Michael, really, really fascinating. Um, two quick questions. Probably most of the second section is going to be sort of um, Tested and validated in our discussion room. So, one quick question. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Where do you get your ideas from when developing this? Or do you develop those ideas on your own? In other words, where, where do you look for the examples to follow? Uh, I'll try and answer that in two ways. So, I think in terms of what services we offer, actually, we don't know all the answers. So, if we take lessers as an example, how they kind of choose what level of risk, what they're willing to pay for, really is a dialogue with them. And so a lot of the services that we're tweaking now is very much a collaboration about how do we provide a suite of services that can match different customers' needs. Um, I suppose the other part is, so it was an interesting discussion I had in the break about data analytics, you know, how much data do you just acquire for the sake of acquiring it? and what do you try and acquire based on knowing it's going to be useful. Um, I think the cost of data is coming down so much that actually you've got to sort of push the boat on some of that. So some of the services we can offer today, we wouldn't have envisaged five or ten years ago, and yet these are on assets that might be in service for 25 years. So that future-proofing and the ability to, you know, if the data becomes cheaper, actually there's all sorts of new ideas that it can open up. And often we find things by looking at data that we didn't expect in the first place. So, so yes, you have to start from what's the kind of key value streams that you're going to get out of it, what are the basics. But there is also an element of you learn by doing and you learn by getting more data and, and evaluating it. Jerry Watson, I'm interested in, in the sort of cyber security of uh, some of this situation, yeah. which I think embraces a very wide range of what we've been talking about today. But in particular, presumably remote telemetry doesn't allow actuation of the engine no. in any way, it's purely Correct. monitoring. So, so we have that very distinct divide between the engine electronic controller 
um, the, you know, effectively the, the, the thing that controls all of the fuel, um, all of the behavior of the engine, and that is uh, very, very tightly controlled. It's level A software, there's huge regulations <coughs> about how we do that, and it's very much firewalled. Um, so there's a very controlled way of uploading changes to that software that literally requires you to take a, you know, a CD or a hard drive and do it on, on the engine. And in fact, there's controls about how you do that across multiple engines um, and what kind of running you have to do in between versus the health monitoring system, which can take some of the output for that controller because it gets fed all sorts of information, but also other things like vibration, which you don't need to know to control the engine. Um, and that's more flexible. So I think the interesting thing for us is historically we've kept all of that data on our own servers. When we get some of the future service offerings, actually we need to be able to marry that data with some of the customer data. Um, so then clearly we're reliant on cyber security. I, I think it's massively important to the industry, but what I would say is the kind of data we deal with is probably less sensitive than the financial sector or the health sector. Um, and actually, you know, there's kind of big IT companies that live or die based on their cyber security and they've probably got far more capabilities than Rolls-Royce would ever have in that space. <coughs> so, so some of it is just understanding what the risks are, but working with some really capable suppliers to help us on that. Thank you. One quick last question. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Steve Horsley from uh, Hemis here. Um, I think the civil aviation sector is always being seen as a leader here. Um, to what extent have you been successful in the other slightly more conventional areas across the Rolls Royce portfolio, sort of percolating these ideas? I don't know how to <coughs> yeah. transportation. So, so I think we're, we're starting to feed it across. I mentioned um, ship intelligence, which is a key part of our marine um, sort of, I guess, theme going forwards. And, and really we see we've got a real opportunity there because we have so much knowledge based on the aerospace industry that we can bring to bear. One, one of the challenges with the ship world is a lot of the equipment on a vessel might not be Rolls-Royce equipment. So how do we actually fuse data from non-Rolls-Royce equipment? How do we understand the overall optimization of the ship? Um, when you get to maintenance, how do we optimize the maintenance for the vessel and not just the Rolls-Royce parts on the vessel? So definitely there's a plumbing exercise, if you like, in terms of getting that data from non-Rolls-Royce parts. But as the price of the sensors comes down, I think those kind of services increasingly are going to be possible. Perhaps that's one of the questions we need to ask ourselves in our network discussion. I'm going to leave it there. Michael, thank you very, very much indeed. Absolutely fascinating. The pivot point towards the business model that derived value from selling um, inventory to actually serving as every life cycle is phenomenal. And one again that I think is one we need to bring up. Michael, thank you very much. Thank I you. don't know whether the question before or one more final clap for Michael. Thank you. I don't know whether the penultimate question was a, a planted question, but certainly when I introduce <coughs> Professor John Hain from the IoT um, and on cybersecurity, uh, we're going to hear uh, a lot more about perhaps a but. Um, and so far today we've looked at this from <coughs> our own sectoral point of view. A fascinating story um, from Rolls-Royce. Uh, but if I just pick out a few key words from John CV, um, a life spent in electronics and communications, <coughs> working for British Telecoms and Marconi, um, looking at the Director of Technology and Strategy in Motorola, you get some sort of idea of what might be coming next. He also says he's retired, which I don't believe. There's no such thing as retirement. Um, and clearly spent a long time in the, this Royal Academy and a visiting professor at Bristol um, and also involved in the Internet of Things. We are really, really interested. And following this, we're going to lead into Jennifer, who's going to tell us a little bit more about um, CSIS uh, and the five years to go. And then we'll go into the networking session. But for now, John, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, well, from the, from the title, you might expect me to be telling you how to secure smart infrastructure. Um, and I'm, if, if that's the case, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll let you down now. I'm, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly how to do it. But what I hope to do is to um, maybe give a little bit of a warning, um, but also talk about how, how the industry is moving towards trying to secure infrastructure and indeed a whole, whole range of products. Um, 
So when we think about infrastructure, I, when I think about infrastructure, I think about things like this, um, things like um, the Dartford River crossing, um, the uh, obviously railways, um, both in the bits of the railways you don't tend to see except through the train window, like part of the signalling, but also the things like level crossings, um, where and, and of course railways are an example of something which has always been in. In, 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 in its own time, a smart infrastructure because it's signalling on the railways and knowing where the trains are and knowing when you can uh, let, let a train pass is, is obviously very important from a safety point of view. So, so railways have always had, to some degree, a smart infrastructure. One of the things that we're seeing um, these days is, sorry, in the, in, the, in the top left there, that's a project, um, um, a smart city project where in, in Doncaster, they're um, rolling out smart streetlights. So these are LED streetlights, and these are all controlled by radio, so that you can turn them on and off at the right time. And you can do all kinds of other things, like you can, you can if, if they're not LEDs, but maybe conventional sodium lamps or something like that, you can sense the condition of the lamp and signal that back. And you can also provide sensors on the lamp post for things like proximity. Um, so, for example, if somebody's walking along the street, you can you can turn the lights on or turn the lights up as they go past in the middle of the night to, to improve safety and, and the confidence. Um, so, so that's an interesting example because there it's got it's it's um, it's a remote actuator. I think a lot of the things we've heard about so far today are putting sensors in the infrastructure so that you know what's happening in the infrastructure. But here we're doing more than that. We're actually putting actuators so we can turn things on and off. And that, of course, brings um, another level of complexity and indeed risk. So um, the Internet of Things. So um, I, I guess I'm sort of come from the Internet of Things Club. And uh, there's a kind of unwritten rule in the Internet of Things Club that if you're giving a presentation, you've got to use this slide. Um, so I'm sorry, I've, that's, that's the rules of the game. So this, this is um, intended to give a kind of landscape of the IoT. Um, it used to be called M2M, machine to machine, but nowadays people call it the Internet of Things because it sounds fancy. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting picture because it, it gives you some idea of the kind of scope that people are thinking about. Um, so it's got, kind of in the, almost in the middle, it's got different sectors like buildings, energy, um, consumer and home and so on. Uh, transportation is there. So you can see that several of those sectors are infrastructure related. And then round that it has, um, going right out to the outside, it's actually talking about devices which are in, in the infrastructure. And the point about the IoT is that those devices or those things are being connected together. They're being connected um, to the internet, if you like, although in many cases they're not actually connected to the internet as, as such. But basically we're gathering information from all those devices and pulling it in to some central point where we can start to share the information. And the value really comes from the use of that information and the sharing of the information. Um, and of course that means that there, we, we get to a situation where there can be interactions between these, these things. Um, so you may get interactions between something, for example, in the, the medical sector and something in the, um, the building sector. And you can begin to do things like, for example, use information you're gathering is from smart buildings from, say, a house in which there's an old person living, you can start to get data from that about energy usage, for example, and that can tell you are they getting up in the morning, are they switching the kettle on, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the house at a suitable temperature and so on. So that can be fed back into the, into the healthcare. Um, but it, that's a very positive effect, but that can also be a negative effect as well. And I'll come on to some of that. Um, so why smart? Well, I think we, we've seen that. I won't go into a lot of, de lot of detail on that. Um, why now? Well, first of all, there's an awful lot of hype about the IoT. I'm not quite sure where we are on that, that, that hype curve, whether we've reached the trough of despond yet or whether we're still in the, the peak of, um, oh, I can't remember what the first thing's called, but it's, uh, um, I think we're probably just on the, on the way down at the moment. Um, so there's an awful lot of awareness. So everybody starts to think, well, if it's the internet of everything, then it must cover what I'm doing. So I'll have to start looking at how I use I IoT in my business. Um, also, I think what's very interesting, though, is that we've had huge advances and cost reductions of communication. So almost everywhere you go today, not absolutely everywhere, but almost everywhere you go, you can get access to communication. So you can, 
gather the data from the things um, and you can communicate data to the things to control them if that's what you want to do. Not just um, the communications and networking, but also sensing. So, so, um, so for example, there's a huge market for these and almost every one of the billion or so smartphones um, that is made today has at least one three-axis accelerometer in it and some of them have gyros in as well. Um, and that means that the, the technology for making a very low-cost accelerometer is extremely cheap. So you can now, for example, if you want to put 100 or 1,000 accelerometers scattered over a structure to, to see small misalignments to within um, a resolution of about 0.1 of a degree or so, then that's a very cheap thing to do. So, so why not start to use that kind of technology um, to, to do some sensing of your infrastructure? That, that's maybe a way of avoiding having to, to put optical fibers into the, into the infrastructure when you pour the concrete, because you can go back to a, an existing infrastructure and glue these things on. And of course, there's a lot of budget pressures these days as well, which is pushing us to, to, um, to uh, increase efficiency. So with all of this communications comes a risk as well, and, and security starts to be very, very important, cyber security. Um, we obviously, when we're building infrastructure, we try to prevent unauthorized physical access to it. We put fences up, we put gates, locks, keys, and so on. Um, sometimes when we connect it up, remotely through communications, we forget to do the same thing. And we forget that we, we open up a, a, effectively a virtual door where a malefactor can get into our infrastructure and start to affect it. So we need to think about how we prevent that, that unauthorized virtual access to smart infrastructure. Um, so another interesting question is just what do you mean by your infrastructure if you're building something? So, if you look at that picture, which I think is a rather nice picture actually, it's got an enormous, there's an enormous amount of infrastructure of all kinds of different forms and owned by all kinds of different people. So the, the principal thing, of course, is the Dartford River crossing, a rather magnificent bridge um, carrying the, the, um, the road. Um, and then, of course, you've got all of the street lights, so those can all be controlled. That infrastructure, you could scatter all kinds of sensors there, whether they're optical fiber or accelerometers or or temperature sensors, or anemometers, or whatever you like, you can put lots of in, lots of in, lots of sensors there, which will tell you what's happening to that to that bridge, and if there's any conditions arising that might give you cause for concern. Um, there's the the infrastructure of the of the toll gates in, in the foreground. Um, so all of those things are related, and you can start to merge the information and data that you're getting from all of those. There's some, another sort of infrastructure there which you probably don't think about. And that's all the vehicles which are using it. And, but perhaps you should be thinking about those. And I want to just talk about some of the threats that you ought to be considering by just talking about the vehicles a bit. So, so I don't know if you've, if you've read anything or heard anything about the notorious GPAC. But um, this, this is a, a Chrysler Voyage, I think it's called. It's a, this is an American version, it's a, world, a worldwide sale. Um, this is a relatively new vehicle, um, and like most new vehicles, it's got a very large amount of electronics in it. Um, something like 20% of the cost of a new uh, the vehicle these days is electronics, and that percentage is increasing. Um, it has electronic engine management, it has electronic braking control, um, <coughs> it has a, an infotainment system, it has 3G connectivity, as well as Wi-Fi and other forms of connectivity for all kinds of, of reasons, but the, the 3G connectivity is there because, for one thing, you can, um, you, you've got a phone in it, but you've also got some telematics going, along, going on so that the, uh, the in principle, Chrysler can get information from the car. Um, so these researchers, um, Charlie Miller and Chris Palasek, um, decided, um, well, this is an interesting challenge, what can we do with this? Um, is there any way, given that it's got communications, what can we do with this car um, to compromise it? These are respectable security researchers. There are quite a few unrespectable security researchers. Probably, who, who knows how many are? <coughs> don't tell you about what they're doing. Um, and if you go on, on, online and you type in, into Google GPAC, you'll find on YouTube a video um, of what they did. And it was, public, it was described in... Um, um, uh, uh, in, in Wired magazine in some detail and also um, there is um, you, can, you can find a paper online and they go into a lot of detail about 
how they hacked the vehicle and why they could hack the vehicle. And basically, they, in the video, um, they demonstrate to a wired reporter what they do to the vehicle. So he's driving along with all the windows closed and the pigeons turn up to max. Um, they can't turn the air conditioning on. They turn the volume up to max and they disable the controls on, on, the, on the audio so he can't turn it down. And then they um, had cut the engine um, and they were on the phone so he's he having come off at the next exit. Um, and uh, um, sorry, I've just realised I haven't got a microphone on. The recording will not be picking up my wise words. So hopefully that will improve matters. So, um, and in the end, um, the only way he can, he can stop the car, because they've disabled the brakes, by the way, so the only way he can stop the car is by driving it off the road and into a ditch. Um, so, so some real security flaws. And when you look at what they did, in, in the design of the car, basically they never thought about security. They, they had a, a vehicle with a lot of electronics in it. They had, a, they had a basic electronics platform which they enhanced, but they, when they did that enhancement, they didn't really give any thought to making it secure, and that allowed the hack to happen. And that hack could be done from anywhere in the world by a phone connected to a computer that was on um, a cellular network. So basically going through the internet into the car systems um, and exploiting back doors in the car systems. Um, so what did Chrysler do? Well, they, first of all, they tried to recall all the cars. There were about a million and a half cars in the United States with the same system. Um, so that was a bit unfeasible and everybody was up in arms about it. So eventually they sent all their customers a USB memory stick and said, plug it in and update the software. So it turned Chrysler's security problem into the customer's security problem, not smart. Um, just by contrast, um, this is the Tesla. The Tesla is not so much a car as an IT system on wheels. Um, so it's got a very advanced set of electronics, which, which is designed to be secure um, right from the beginning, but not, not as well as it could have been. Um, so um, the researcher managed to hack that, but with a great deal of difficulty. In the case of the Chrysler, they didn't need to take anything apart. In the case of the Tesla, they had to virtually take apart the head unit, take all the dashboard and everything in order to, to get in and, and do some hardware hacks as well. But they were able to, to, to get into it. Um, and um, they presented their results at a Black Hat Security Conference um, last year in August. Um, and um, the day before, Tesla rolled out a security patch um, which was downloaded to all their vehicles worldwide um, just before, just in time. Um, and um, at, the, at Black Hat, Elon Musk, who, who founded Tesla, presented the guy who did this with a gold medal, um, which is the way to do it. That's, that's how you need to, to work with security researchers. Um, so you think it's just cars? Well, here's um, industrial vehicles. So this... This black box is a thing called a telematics gateway unit. There's quite a lot of people make these, and basically it's a thing you can install in a, in a, in a vehicle, mainly a truck or something like that. It, it's got GPS in it, it's got cellular communications, it, it links into the vehicle systems. It connects to the CAN bus, which is universally used in vehicles for linking together all the different systems. Um, and it allows you to do things like see where your vehicle is, gather condition data, rather like jet engines, not nearly so sophisticated. Um, you can do things like geofencing, so you can, you can draw a line on a map. So if the driver crosses the line, it, it causes an alarm to come up. Um, there's no security in those devices in this particular model. Um, so even, even the level of security that's in the Chrysler wasn't in this. So, so in principle, you could use that kind of device. You can find those devices on the internet if you know a little bit about the architecture you can find those, you can sit at a PC and you can find those devices on the internet. Um, and then you can potentially hack into them. So where does, how does that relate to infrastructure? Is that a tanker? Or is it a bomb? If you can hack into the vehicle systems and make it do things it's not supposed to do, if you can cause it to drive into <coughs> the pier of a bridge, into a pier on the Dartford River crossing, then it becomes a weapon. So you can see why certain groups might be motivated to try and hack the kind of, at least the vehicle systems, and use those to attack infrastructure. 
And if you start designing smart infrastructure, which has two-way communications, then light the street lights so they can do things like start to turn off the street lights. Or if it's traffic lights, they can turn off the traffic lights or set all the lights to red so everything grinds to a halt. Or if it's a railway signalling system with a level crossing, then they can hack into the system and so the lights have gone to red, uh, the flashing lights, the barriers have come down, everyone stops, there's a queue of traffic each side and then just before the train goes through, oh, the gates lift, lights go to green, all the traffic starts to flow and, and the train plows into the traffic. So several ways you can exploit smart infrastructure to um, cause mayhem. Now these systems, when you put them together, are very complicated. Um, and this, this picture tries to show how complicated they can be. So, so we've got different forms of radio communication which connect all of the, the things to the internet. Um, the internet's probably got some cloud service platforms and there are various people who are gathering information from those and making use of it. So a huge range of different players in this. So who, who in that spectrum of players is responsible for security? Um, is there any one person? Probably not. Who secures the devices of the things? Those things, um, quite, a, quite a simple device, let alone a car, quite a simple device like maybe a communicating thermostat, a Nest thermostat, for example, can have a lot of different parties supplying components for it. So it has software developers, chip suppliers, it has, maybe has communications modules in it, which they, all coming from different suppliers, all being put together by a company that, ju that just designs and manufactures on a subcontract basis for um, a brand owner. Um, and then the brand owner markets and supports the device with the user. So a long chain of, of parties there all have to play their part in making the system secure. Um, so if you look at that infrastructure there and ask yourself, from your perspective, who is responsible for safety, then you probably could answer that question. You could probably say, well, actually, we all have to be responsible for safety. The people who do the design, the construction, the contractors, the people who operate it, whether it's the bridge or it's the gates or, or the road surface or, or the street lights, everyone in that chain has to be responsible for safety. They all bear some responsibility for safety. We need to have the disciplines in place to make sure that we achieve safety. And the same is true, really, of the Internet of Things, that um, it's, it, it depends on um, each player in the chain to be responsible. And that that's, needs to be recognised by everyone who is hoping to apply these techniques in their industry. So we need to develop a chain of trust between the different parties um, in the supply chain. And that's really what the Security Foundation is all about, is to bring together parties in the IoT supply chain right the way from the, maybe the very small one-man band who's developing software at one end, right through to the major contractor who's maybe commissioning a bridge, and right through to the highway operator at the other end and, and possibly the users um, to make sure that, that we, we have a way of satisfying the needs of everyone in that, in that chain. So what we want to do is to build that chain of trust. Um, I'm going through these slides quickly. Who are we? Well, we have a, already we have about 56 members. We've, we've been going a little bit more, a little bit, no, actually not quite six months. So um, we have about 56 members and they range from major industry players like Arm, BT, uh, Vodafone, um, NXP, the chip company, um, right the way through to some quite small product companies, gadget companies, software developers, a reasonable representation of the academic community. But what we don't have at the moment is, is a large representation if you like, from the user community. So that's one area that we're in, very interested in, in building up so that we understand the kind of security requirements and constraints that come from other industries who will be dependent on our product. I won't go through into a lot of detail about how we work, but the most important thing we're trying to do is to put in place a self-certification scheme, which is an, an auditable self-certification scheme so that um, players in the chain have a way of looking to their suppliers to, 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 to um, assure themselves that what they're getting is built with security in mind um, and can do the same thing to their customers. 
we have a number of working groups, a number of work streams. This is just an, an initial set. Um, and um, most important one is the, is the work stream to set up this self-certification group, the self-certification scheme. Um, I, if you want to know more about the others later, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I think the most important things I should emphasise are that security should be designed in from the start. It's not something you can successfully retrofit, or it's, at least it's extremely difficult to retrofit. You need to make it fit for purpose, so you need to think about things like what are the threats? What could people do to break the security? You have to have... Um, it's, it's not just a matter of designing it once and, or just designing it in an abstract sense. You need to challenge it, criticise it. You need to get the right people in the chain to do that. It needs to be resilient. So don't ask yourself, what will I do if my security is compromised? The question is, what will I do when my security is compromised? Because if, it, if you've got a piece of infrastructure which is worth compromising, it will be compromised. You can rely on that. or we'll assume that it will be compromised. So that's us. Thank you. John, a huge thank you. I'm going to slightly break the protocol because we want to get ourselves into the networking debate. Can I ask that any questions we'll take as we start that first discussion? So I'm going to introduce Jennifer, um, who's our last speaker. Jennifer, there's much more about CS. I see. Um, if I look very quickly to pick out some keywords here. Um, a PhD in the Teal Science at the University of Cambridge, appointed director <coughs> of CSIC in May 2013, has spent many years in the research and development world, um, leading cross disciplinary teams to bring together turbo molecular pumps and semiconductors in Edwards vacuums. We can talk more about that later. Jennifer, we're excited to hear what the next <coughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. And, um, on behalf of CSIC, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming today because this event would be nothing without all of you in the audience. Um, I'm not going to take too long, you'll be delighted to hear, because I think it's much more important that we get on to the debate. But I did just want to reflect a little on where CSIC has been and where it's going. Um, <coughs> you've heard a lot this afternoon about the potential opportunities represented by smart infrastructure solutions, particularly including the power of data and information to transform the way we do things, be that the way we design, the way we deliver, the way we operate, or indeed the service offerings that as individual businesses we offer. We've also heard about some of the challenges to delivery, the technical challenges highlighted by some of the cyber security issues, for example, but also um, we haven't talked about this so much, but I'm very aware that there are a number of institutional or structural challenges, which we talked about a little bit in our industry, it's a fragmented industry, it's conservative for a number of very understandable reasons. Um, I know that in conversation outside I talked about the challenges around procurement and that sort of thing. Um, so there's great opportunity, there are a number of challenges to achieving the, 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 the opportunities. So how can we all work together for the next five years, which CSIC has been fortunate enough to be funded for and which helpfully Andrew framed the, <laughs> the, the, the whole afternoon with um, earlier on saying in five years time if the UK wanted to be seen as the place to go to understand how smart infrastructure should be delivered, what should change? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the vision that CSIC has for that, but I'm also very open to hearing from all of you, either in the discussion or over a glass of wine later, um, as to what you think the key role that we can play is and the key role that you will need to play. And if so over the last five years, we've collaborated with industry <coughs> in a whole range of ways. We've done a whole lot of... Um, development of new technologies and approaches. We've deployed them in a range of exciting and interesting environments. We've done a number of case studies about different approaches with, with industry partners. And we've also been involved in the development of standards and guidance documents to help the industry understand how to take this stuff forward. Um, and in addition to that, as Andrew mentioned, we've also um, been involved in helping partners, and Skanska is the sort of gold standard for this, um, in terms of commercialisation support, so trial deployments, training, um, understanding what the revenues might be, that sort of thing. Um, and obviously we need to continue this, so we've got a range of exciting and interesting technology areas that we want to push forward in. Um, this was our first attempt at this, it's now evolving, um, but as you can see there's plenty to do there, but it's not the complete picture. Um, there are a number of challenges, I mentioned some of them earlier, but when we talked to our partners before we went forward for our phase two funding application, 
the four kind of key areas that came out of the discussions that we had were a lack of integrated solutions. So there's lots of good building blocks being established, but we're not very good at knitting all of that together. I think if you reflect on Michael's presentation earlier from Rolls-Royce, you can see how they, they moved up the sort of the, the value chain by understanding better how to use data in different ways to provide different services. Um, there are challenges around our, our industry's appetite for innovation, and I think that applies at every level of the industry, from the client through the designers and contractors through to the, the people supplying various sort of elements of the, of the supply chain. And part of that rests on the fact that there's a lack of a strong business case at the moment. Um, we've got lots of individual good examples, and there are some occasions, and Andrew's example earlier was one of them, where if the entire responsibility for the life cycle of the innovation rests with one organisation, then they can see the value and they can invest. So in Andrew's case earlier, he can see immediate value in deploying fibre optics because it improves safety, he gets better information out of it and so on. Um, one could argue there's further value that others in the supply chain could get from that data, um, but there's a complexity when you get to a situation where perhaps an investment at the beginning of the life only starts to pay dividends 10 years down the line, and you've had two or three contracts and changes of um, ownership of the data in that time. Um, and finally, there are some challenges around evolving our supply chain, and by that I mean our smart solution supply chain, to a point where there is choice in the market. Because until you've got choice, you don't really have a supply chain. You're, you're held hostage by the one person that can supply you with the, uh, with the opportunity. So there's a range of challenges that need to be addressed. Um, in CSIC, we have a plan for addressing some of those. Um, the things that are in purple on this slide are the things that we that are new in phase two of CSIC. So how we integrate the solutions, and we need to talk to you guys to understand what integration means to you and what value means to you from these solutions. How we can use longer term demonstration programs or perhaps look at different individual examples of value throughout the life cycle of different structures um, or different assets to understand where value comes and, and how we can um, deliver that value so that we can start to feed that into a business case that works for the industry. And we've got to, you know, there are some things we're going to have to live with, there are some things we're going to be able to change as an industry. And then finally, as I say, developing the supply chain. And there's a lot we already do, but there's a lot that others in this room can do as well. So what's the opportunity in all of this? Well, I think we've heard a lot of it already. Um, there are a number of challenges facing our infrastructure. We've talked about them earlier. Um, in particular, a lot of our assets are aging. We need to get more out of our existing assets um, because we can't build our way out of, out of these um, the, the sort of loading challenges that we have. We're facing climate change, we're facing demographic change. We eternally have less money available than we engineers would like to maintain our beautiful structures and keep them in tip-top condition and so forth. So we need to innovate to address this in a way that we can afford. Um, but particularly in the UK, I think, we have a real opportunity in this space. You've heard from a range of people today who are looking to move things forward, not just in our industry, but in other industries. Um, we've got a world leading digital industry, and John speaks for, for part of that. Um, we have a lot of experience of coaxing Victorian assets to give us more all the time. Um, and we've got a range of excellent research going on, not just in Cambridge, I have to say, but in the wider um, collaboration that's happening at the moment in the UK Collaboratorium for Research in Infrastructure and Cities, which you may not have heard of. We call it UCRIC because we can't say all of that. Um, that involves, at the moment, 14 universities across the UK and will involve more. So I think there's a real opportunity here if only we seek to grasp it. Um, and I think the revolution that Mark talked about earlier is coming. And we can either lead that revolution or we can follow. Um, we heard about the fact that Germany is pushing Industry 4.0. They're pushing it in manufacturing at the moment. We could push it in the construction and infrastructure world if only we choose to take that lead in order to deliver the true smart infrastructure that we need in the future. Thank you very much.